German and English. We get to celebrate with some German because that was kind of how this congregation uh, was formed. Services were in German in the early days, and so in order to celebrate our heritage, we're going to do a little bit of German too. Don't worry. If you looked in there, you see there's also English translations. So uh, do your best if you can to speak uh, German when you have to do it. I think that's actually only probably on the hymns, and we will worship the Lord together and remember his blessings to us over the years. So you have hopefully your service folder that you picked up on the way in. It tells you that our opening hymn is Yesu gave or on. Let's take a few moments for silent prayer and worship uh, to prepare our hearts for worship. God bless us. Please stand. Im Namen des Herrn, der Himmel und Erde gemacht hat. Amen. In the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Lasset uns Gott unsere Sünden bekennen und im Namen unseres Herrn Jesu Christi und Vergebung bitten. Let us confess our sin to God and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ ask for forgiveness. Denn so wir sagen, wir haben keine Sünde, so verführen wir uns selbst und die Wahrheit ist nicht in uns. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So wir aber unsere Sünde bekennen, so ist Gott treu und gerecht dass er uns die Sünde vergibt und reinigt uns von aller Untugen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Ich armer, sündiger Mensch, bekenne dir, allmächtigen Gott, 
meinen Schöpfer und Erlöser. I, a poor sinful being, confess to you, Almighty God, my Maker and Redeemer, dass ich nicht allein gesündiget habe mit Gedanken, Worten und Werken, that I have not only sinned against you by thoughts, words and deeds, sondern auch in Sünden empfangen und geboren bin, but also I have been conceived and born in sin, also, dass alle meine Natur und Wesen vor seine Gerechtigkeit sträflich und verdammtlich ist. And that all my nature and being is lost and condemned. Darum fliehe ich zu seine grundlose Barmherzigkeit, such und bitt um Gnade. Wherefore we flee for refuge to thine infinite mercy. Seeking and praying for thy boundless grace. Herr, sei gnädig mit mir armen Sinder. Lord, be merciful to me, a poor sinner. Der Allmächtige, Barmherziger Gott hat sich unser erbarmt, seinen eingeborenen Sohn Jesum Christum für unser alle Sünde in den Tod dahin gegeben auf das alle, die an ihn glauben, nicht verroren werden, sondern das ewige Leben haben. The almighty, merciful God has had mercy on us and has given his only Son into death for all our sins, so that all who believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Der Herr sei mit euch. The Lord be with you. Und mit deinem Geiste. Lasset uns beten. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and do what is right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lasset uns mit den ganzen Christenheit auf Erden bekennen unseren allerheiligsten Glauben. Let us confess our faith with the whole Christian Church on earth. Ich glaube an Gott, den Vater Allmächtigen, Schöpfer Himmels und Erden. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. Und an Jesus Christum, seinen eingeborenen Sohn, unseren Herrn, der empfanget ist von den Heiligen Geiste, geboren von Maria, der Jungfrau, gelittet unter Pancio Palato, gekreuzigt, gestorben und begraben, niedergefahren zur Helle, am dritten Tage wieder auferstanden von den Toten, aufgefahren gen Himmel, sitze zur Rechten Gottes, des Allmächtigen Vaters, von dannen er kommt wird, zu richten die Lebendigen und die Toten. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Ich glaube an Gott, den Heiligen Geist, eine heilige christliche Kirche, die Gemeinde der Heiligen, Vergebung der Sünden, Auferstehen des Fleisches und ein ewiges Leben. Amen. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lasset uns beten. Let us pray. Vater unser, der du bist in Himmel, our Father, who art in heaven, geheiliget werde dein Name, hallowed be thy name, Dein Reich komme. Thy kingdom come. 
Dein Wille geschehe wie in Himmel, also auch auf Erden. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Unser täglich Brot gib uns heute. Give us this day our daily bread. Und vergib uns unsere Schuld, als wir vergeben unseren Schuldigern. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Und führe uns nicht in Versuchung. And lead us not into temptation. Sondern erlese uns von den Übel. But deliver us from evil. Denn dein ist das Reich und die Kraft und die Herrlichkeit in Ewigkeit. Amen. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue now with our next hymn. I'll assist on Gottes Segen. That's printed on page 7 in your service folder. Our epistle lesson from God's Word for this evening comes from the New Testament book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. This lesson will be the sermon text this evening. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light." For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness 
and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of our Lord. Then out of respect for the words and works of our Lord, please stand for the gospel lesson. Today's gospel comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. This anniversary weekend, we are celebrating generation after generation of God's grace upon his people. Well, this lesson tells us exactly where that grace comes from. It doesn't come from what we do or who we are. No, it comes entirely from God's word. Even still, after all this time, that is the one thing needed for us. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Let's continue now with our hymn of the day, Ein Feste Burg ist unser Gott, that is printed beginning on page 8 in your service folder.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, seems like we've been talking an awful lot about trees around church here lately. Maybe you've noticed that. That's the way it seems to me. We've had some trees that have, that have been cut down recently, some more that might have to be, some more that we might not want to because they were given by some specific graduating class or donor, and whether we want to replace those trees we take down with new ones that will grow back up. And thinking about those trees got me thinking about another common thing that really is kind of picking up steam nowadays, and that is planting memorial trees. Now, I don't know just all that much about that tradition, but what I do know about it says that it's a way to let someone's memory live on, a way to give back to the earth, a way to give a tangible place for someone's loved ones and relatives to come back to so that they can remember that. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that that is a bad tradition. Actually, giving back to the earth and wanting to beautify the area can be great examples of a final act of stewardship of God's gifts in this world. But what I am telling you is that on this anniversary weekend, when we look back on our past and look toward our future, we can do better than only planting memorial trees outside of church to celebrate. And that's because actually what Paul told us in our epistle lesson for today is that most importantly, you are God's true memorial trees. And throughout our lives, throughout the history of this church, and until he comes again, our Lord calls us to keep growing, keep growing roots through the gospel and keep growing fruits through good works. And so Paul starts here by telling us all the things God does for us as as the gospel helps us keep growing. First of all, he addresses this letter to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. The gospel of Jesus Christ makes us holy and faithful in God's sight, things that we could never be on our own. By nature, see, we are so very imperfect. We are selfish and cold and stubborn and fickle and refusing to want anybody to tell us what to do. But now here's the good news. Here's the gospel. Jesus was not any of those things. For our sake and in our place, he was selfless and warm and loving and completely dedicated to his Father's will and to our salvation in this world, which meant not only being perfect for us, but dying on the cross to pay for all the times that we haven't been. Because of what Jesus did for us, because he took away our unholiness and gave us his holiness instead, now that's the way God sees us. He sees us as holy. He sees us as faithful. And God doesn't just look at us that way. But the gospel actually motivates us now to live that way too. The gospel changes us and strengthens us to be holy Because in God's sight, we are holy. And the gospel strengthens us and changes us to be faithful to God and his word, even in this world that is so totally faithless and godless. In short, the gospel puts down roots in our hearts and lives that nothing in this world can overcome. And that's because the gospel gives grace and peace to you from God our Father that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. What Jesus did for us when he lived and died and rose again for us was the purest grace, the most amazing undeserved love that drives away any fear or doubt or worry or shame that the devil could ever throw in our face and instead delivers to us peace that transcends it all. I mean, what legitimate reason do we have in this this world when we know 
our God, our Heavenly Father, sent his own Son to save us? What legitimate reason do we have to fear or doubt or worry or be ashamed? What legitimate reason do we have in this broken, fleeting world when we have the certain hope for heaven's perfect paradise one day? If we know our God loves us and has proven it again and again, if we know that our Savior has won the victory for us over every last enemy we have, if we know that the Spirit is working powerfully in our lives by faith, and if we know that a heavenly eternity is the outcome because he has promised it and he does not lie to us, then that gives us a foundation and confidence for our faith lives as deep and solid as the biggest redwood in California. And make no mistake, it is vitally important to be rooted so strongly because the storms and winds and hail will come. In fact, the whole reason Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians was because that's what was beginning to happen for them. There were false teachers creeping into their congregation like pests and disease creep into a forest. These teachers were, without going into the minute details, they were telling these Colossians that Jesus was not enough for them. They were downgrading his person and work. They were saying that if you really want to know that God is on your good side, you need to keep these certain laws and you need to worship and pray in certain ways. But no, Paul says, those kinds of man-made teachings rot the church from the inside out like a fungus rots a tree. And the, and the only antidote was the gospel in all its truth and purity. And the truth is, that is still just the same way nowadays. Whether it is things like indulgences or, or praying to the saints or forcing satisfactions for sin like we just got done studying in our Augsburg Confession Bible class or whether it's making things like conversion and the sacraments into things that we have to do for God rather than things that God graciously does for us or whether it's making up our own rules and standards about what we have to wear and how we have to act and how we have to me measure up in our expectations or expect other people to measure up in our expectations rather than God's, still, those same kinds of modern-day attitudes can be just as damaging to our faith life. But again, the only true antidote is the gospel in God's word and sacraments used regularly and often again and again here in church and wherever you call home because only the gospel can root us solidly and deeply in the truth and only the gospel can turn us from spiritual saplings into spiritual hardwoods that can stand up to anything that comes against us. But the mark of a good tree isn't just that it has a strong root system. No, the deeper it goes, the taller it grows. And the better the roots, the better the fruits. See, our God doesn't just want us to keep growing in here through the gospel. He also wants us to keep growing in our good works, too. He wants our inner spiritual growth to be reflected outwardly in our lives in this world. In fact, Paul prays for God's people to have all spiritual wisdom and understanding in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. And then he gives four ways that we can do that. The first one, Paul says, is by bearing fruit in every good work. You see, when a gardener plants a fruit tree and tends it and takes care of it until it's grown, he's doing it for a specific purpose, so that one day it will bear fruit that he can enjoy. And the same is true with how God works with us, too. Paul says in Ephesians that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus 
to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Through his gospel message, God specially planted and tends and cares for every one of us so that we can bear the kinds of fruits in our lives that he has prepared for us. And, and those are going to be different in every different person's case. Are you a husband or wife? Well, be loving and faithful. Are you a father or mother? Love your children and care for your children like God, your heavenly father, cares for you. Are you, uh, are you blessed with wisdom or wealth? Share them generously and cheerfully to benefit our ministry and encourage God's people. Are you an employer or an employee? Use your gifts and opportunities faithfully to benefit all those around you. Do you have some special gift or ability that, that can be of great help to others? Well, then offer it willingly, just like Christ has willingly offered to you every good gift in this world. No matter who you are or what circumstance of life you find yourself in, God is working in your life, and he is calling you to keep growing by bearing fruit in every good work. And then the next thing Paul says is that you can do that by growing in the knowledge of God. Well, how do you do that? It's by being right here in God's house, gathered together with God's people, gathered around his word and sacraments for worship and Bible study. The devil loves to try to convince us that we have other things that need to get done or that Public worship is not so vital for our lives. And he tries to convince us of that because he knows exactly how vital it is for our lives. You see, public worship here in God's house with our fellow believers, gathered around God's word and sacraments, not only feeds our faith, strengthens our ties with Jesus and with one another, and severs our ties with Satan, but our God, God our Heavenly Father, loves it when we come together in love and harmony as his family. When we come together for public worship, we are both putting down deeper roots and bearing more bountiful fruit. And it, in the lives of believers, it doesn't get any better than that. But I do know that it doesn't always work out perfectly that way in this sinful world and things don't always go just like we would want them to. And so that's why Paul says the last two ways we can bear fruit in our lives are by having great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father. You know, there's a famous poem written by John Milton called On His Blindness. John Milton was a famous author. He authored Paradise Lost, among other big writings, and, and by all accounts, he was very, very talented. But toward the end of his life, John Milton began to go blind, and that really was a bother for him because he thought that he was less and less useful to society, and he knew that God had given him talents that he wanted to be used faithfully and well. But the point of the poem is that service to God can come in all sorts of different forms. And for someone who might struggle with their health or with other issues, Milton closes his poem with this famous line, They also serve who only stand and wait. So maybe there are some shut-ins who need to hear that because they are feeling that way. Maybe some of you wish you could do more or give more. Maybe some of you beat yourselves up over what you used to be able to do or what you should have done in the past but didn't. Well, those encouragements from God's word are just for you. Even if you can't work as hard or do as much physically as you used to, believe me when I tell you, you can have every bit as much of a positive impact and more 
by giving a godly example of contentment and humility and trust and sharing your wisdom and patience and endurance and joy and thankfulness with the people around you who need it. Even when times are bad, and especially when times are bad, even when your health is heading downhill, even when you are laying on your back in a nursing home, nothing makes more of a difference than your encouragement to those around you to be faithful in their callings, your endurance and patience as you put your times in God's hands, and your joy and thankfulness as you remember what Jesus has done for you and stay focused on the heavenly home that he's preparing for you. And why can you do that? Well, it's because you are a tree that has been transplanted. As Paul says, your God has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So this anniversary weekend, let's think about memorial trees. But not like the world does it. Because ultimately, we are not trying to remember us and the great things that we and our ancestors have done. No, we ourselves are the memorial trees, rooted in the gospel and bearing fruit in every good work to the glory of God and by his grace alone. So with thanks to our Lord for everything he has done through us in this place in the past and the present, and with hope that by his grace we can leave an example of faithfulness and love for the future. My dear friends, Let's keep growing. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue now with our offering. Let's bring our thank offerings to our Lord. Ask that while the offerings are being collected, please sign the friendship registers located at the ends of your pews. Thank you. Please stand. Let's continue now with the prayer of the church and go on from there on to the rest of page 10 and beyond. <coughs> o God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. At this anniversary, we reflect on your past help and are encouraged in our hope for the future. We praise you for keeping and sustaining your people throughout the ages and for preserving the preaching of your word and the administration of your sacraments among us. We praise you also for using us to bring to others the good news that sinners are reconciled to you through the life and death of Jesus Christ. Now we ask you to give us courage and hope as we move day by day into the future. Keep safe all those who assemble here in your name do not permit the evil one to pluck us out of your mighty hand. 
Strengthen us in the confidence that you have already overcome our greatest enemies, sin, death, and the devil. Increase our trust in your precious promise that you are with us always. Cause your Holy Spirit to work mightily in us and through us so that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be with us as we strive to pass down to our children the truths that have been passed down to us. Continue to make our congregation a beacon of your light in this sin-darkened world. Lord, we also ask you to be with the family and friends of Laureen Grimm, who went home to heaven to be with you on Tuesday. We thank you for giving her such a long, full life of opportunities to serve and glorify you. And we thank you for taking her away from suffering and fulfilling her hopes by now bringing her to the eternal joys of heaven. Be now with those of us who grieve here on earth. Give us hope too, so that we can be confident that one day we will see our loved one again and together behold you face to face. Lord, please also guide and bless my deliberations as I've been called to serve as youth and family pastor of St. John's Lutheran Church in Lannan, Wisconsin. Give me wisdom and willingness to serve you wherever is best. Give your people in Norfolk and Lannan a spirit of humble encouragement and contentment and open my mind and heart to see where I can be of greatest benefit for my family and for your kingdom. And finally, Lord, we also ask you to be with all those among our congregation, family, and friends who are struggling with their health or working through personal difficulties. You know who they are. So if it is your will, please give them all quick comfort, healing, and recovery. But in all things, focus their eyes of faith on you so that they can see your good purposes in this life and look forward to their perfect life eternal. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Grant that this celebration of your gracious activity in years and ages past be only the prelude to that far greater celebration we will enjoy forever in the joy and glory of the world to come. Still be our guard while troubles last and our eternal home. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated and follow the direction of the ushers. Please stand for prayer. O oh God, the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Empfanget mit glaubigen Herzen den Segen des Herrn. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of the Lord. Der Herr segne dich und behüte dich. Der Herr erleuchte sein Angesicht über dir und sei dir gnädig. Der Herr erhebe sein Angesicht auf dich und gebe dir Frieden. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. You may be seated for the closing hymn, Ach bleib mit deiner Gnade, that's printed for you on page 11. 